Hello and welcome to the last Movers and Shakers virtual event of 2020. My name is Lena Tasha Salter and I'm Managing Director of Movers and Shakers. Well, despite a difficult year with COVID adapting to new ways of working, we've really enjoyed putting on our series of virtual events. We've had some great sessions over the years, some fantastic contributors. And if you've missed any of these sessions, do go onto our YouTube channel, do have a look through our last events and do enjoy and subscribe. We've got some exciting plans as well for next year. We'll be having a new state-of-the-art virtual platform and networking app. So you'll be able to network alongside watching all of our events. And hopefully towards the middle of the year, our events will be hybrid and it'll be nice to see all of our members back in person. Okay, so today for our last event, uh, we have an interview which we're calling Leading from the Top. We welcome back Chris Grigg, who is, of course, the outgoing chief executive of British Land. And he's going to be interviewed today by Sam McClary, editor of EG. And we've had Chris speaking for us over many years. In fact, he spoke at our first event in London of this year, which was held at the Lancaster Hotel, when we asked the leaders across the private and public sector to predict the year ahead. Well, quite clearly, none of them could actually predict 2020 and the year ahead. But today, it's very apt that we have Chris closing our last event of the year. Now, Chris has been Chief Executive of British Land for a staggering 12 years. He joined the top job at British Land at a time in the depths of the financial crisis. He had to restructure and rebalance the investment portfolio for British Land. And during his tenure, he's had to deal with the uncertainty of Brexit, the massive changes of the high street, and also more recently, COVID-19. But under his stewardship, he has driven some really positive cultural change. He's championed diversity and he's got real respect as a leader. So it's fantastic to have Chris here today. And I know that Sam's going to ask all the right questions. We want to know what uh, Chris will take away from his time at British Land. You know, what is the summary of his experience? What are his highlights? What are the challenges of leading a PLC Propco? What are the lessons learned? And what next for Chris Grigg? So without further ado, I'm going to welcome Chris and of course, Sam. And if you do have any questions, please ask them in the usual way using the Q&A tab. Thank you very much. Over to Chris and Sam. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Lee. Thanks for having, having me. And uh, I will in, indeed endeavour to ask all the right questions and probably some wrong ones too. But uh, none of us are, are perfect, are we? So we'll go for it. Chris, thanks so much for, for joining us today. And Zisa, thanks for um, finishing off a, um, a really odd odd year. And I know it's the, it's the last few days really for you in, in tenure after, um, as you said, more than a decade leading BL. And we have just around 45 minutes to bombard you with questions and, and, and learn as much as we can from you. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go straight for it and, um, and really ask you what you think the greatest things that you brought to BL were and what the greatest lessons you'll take away from BL are. Gosh, I'm, I'm not sure words like greatest are, are, are quite appropriate. I, you know, for me, what one of the things that, that I think um, maybe I brought a sense of modernization to the place and it had been very successful historically. But I think in a sense, when I arrived, I was struck by the fact it, it, it was appropriate to modernize the place. And, you know, that piece around diversity for me was just one part of that process. So, so maybe that's that those that that modernity that we tried to bring to the place and it is a we not an i by the way um you know that was a big part of it obviously of some of the buildings that, that, that we created uh, are cool things to have done and uh, you know not that many people get to to actually look at a london skyline and said you know we and a bunch of people did that uh, especially the cheese grater I, I guess in that regard what what are the lessons i take away you know, as ever, I think that the big lessons are usually about people and about decision making. You know, it's it's you, you learn a lot if you if you run an organization for 12 years of any any size or scale. And so I guess it's a lot about, you know, trying to get the best out of people as some of the things I've learned. And you, you talk there about um, people and about the diversity initiatives that, that you brought in. And, um, and most people know that that you know people and diversity is something I'm very passionate about. So I'd love to hear a little bit more from you about what what it was actually that put diversity in into your mindset and how 
how I guess those initial conversations at BL went and 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 now it feels from an outside looking in that's part it's part of the DNA of British land now I think so I mean and that you know again if you look back as any leader should I think it is what are the changes that I've made that might not be permanent because that's just a wrong word but you know have 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 changed the way the organization has done something and that that does stuff and I think we certainly changed that and that again has been a big effort I think when I look back but even at the time when I first arrived I was struck by the fact that diversity wasn't just a subject that that got much airtime either at BL or in the industry and I you know come from financial services which for all its faults uh, in the diversity space and elsewhere you know it had been something that had been talked about a lot and actually quite a lot of activity over the previous 10-15 years um, and it, it, it did feel that that process just hadn't really gotten going with, in large chunks of the industry. So it felt natural as part of that modernization process that I touched upon to put diversity in, into that. And always, as you know, Sam, what I always tried to do was to make the business case and not have it stand out on its own. That, that you know, diversity would lead to better decision making. That would make us a strong, stronger company. Uh, and, and I think that's that's the lesson. Sure. And uh, one of the questions I have written down here for you is what's the hardest part of being a CEO? And before we get into that, I wonder what the hardest part of pushing a diversity strategy is when uh, you are a, a white middle class man. You know, I wonder if that came with its own struggles. You, at least you didn't say old. So I thought you could get the whole, <laughs> the whole list. Not that rude. <laughs> um, you know what? I never really let that bother me my view's always been that it's up it's for other people to say that and and I felt strongly about it I think most people knew I felt strongly about it and that all struck me as kind of good enough um and if you make the case you make the case and of course people can say well how about you but you know we tried to increase the number of women on the board as an example to increase the number of women on x all those sorts of things I think it's kind of action speak louder than words uh, and then to have people, you know, come to me and say, actually, I joined the company because it felt like a modern company. It felt those are the things I think you take pleasure out of not worrying too much about, you know, your own gender in these discussions. Yeah, yeah, excellent. And then, well, let's talk about other hard decisions there are as as, as a CEO. As as um, as was mentioned in the intro, you know, you joined the company at a time when we had were just. Uh, uh, coming out of um, a, a really tough time. You're leaving when we're uh, in another tough time. There's been some ups and downs in, be in between there. Um, have, do you look back at that time and think, oh, I wish I hadn't done that, or that was the hardest, that was a, a decision I didn't really want to take? Or do you look at everything through a, a lens of learning? The latter, I think. I mean, you know, there, there are things which I think we didn't get right, that I didn't get right. Um, Such as? Oh, look, you know, we said, I said publicly that we should have sold more retail earlier. Um, that's a good example. I think the people decisions are definitionally hard. Those decisions around who you hire, who you promote, promote who you, you know, decide, you know, <laughs> that, that, that their time has come in an organization, in any organization. So those are hard decisions, but they're also the heart, I think, of, of what being, uh, you know, senior leader, whether you're chief executive or otherwise, are about. Uh, and so... Those are the things that one will always look back on and say, I could have done it quicker, I shouldn't have done it, all those things. But it's the people decisions, I think, that, 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 that make you as a chief executive. And therefore, you know, you have to live with those decisions. Yeah, yeah. And, and having spoken to, to Simon recently, he's obviously taking, taking over from, from you, um, he, he recalled to me that the, the main thing he's learned from you, lots of things, obviously, but the main thing that he's learned from you is about finding time in the day for strategic thought and not just letting the job of being being the boss over overwhelm you. And I'd love to know, and I'm sure the audience would as well, what how you do that because it, it's certainly something that I struggle with. How do I how do I um, allot my time in the in the right way? And it it, it sounds like you've got it right. So um, do share the secret. I wish I, I wish I could uh, convince myself that 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 I ever did it exactly right. I, I mean, I think it is partly just that recognition for all of us, right? That th these are busy jobs, and that, that in a sense, 
you, you, you don't want to get distracted because you happen to be the chief executive. You, you just know that you've got to allot your time wisely. And what I tried to do was very much, you know, not have any meetings on a Friday. And why did I do that? Because first of all, it allowed a bit of overflow, you know, those things you, you knew you needed to get done. But more important to that, that, that was every Friday, I knew I would have time allotted for, you know, I'm not sure about strategic thoughts, but but <laughs> but about the space to do the thinking, if you will. And I, I think that's a that's a good discipline. It worked for me. I know different people who do it in different ways, but that's how I, I found a way of doing it. And is, is that something that you um, try to in, instill throughout the business as well, that people need to take time out from the, 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 I guess, the sort of physical aspect of their job to make sure they're thinking about what else they can do, what else they can deliver, how to continue to modernise British land as a, as a business? You know, I think it's something you can only talk about and leave people to make their own decisions on that stuff. I think it's, you know, you, you will take time off, off on a Friday is, is a kind of dangerous piece of advice to give, I think. <laughs> uh, well, you know, who knows these days exactly where we're going to end up. But, but I do think that if you, people see that you, you try and make time, then hopefully some of that rubs off. And, you know, it sounds like Simon, <laughs> if I haven't seen that, then that's good enough for me, you know. Excellent. Good enough. And and having that that time to think about um, the operation of business and the the relationships, I think has has been shown to be particularly important during during this year. And I know um, you and I have, have spoken before about um, the relationships that there needs to be between um, landlord and tenant, for want of better better words, between. Um, uh, employer and employee, employees. So I'd love to um, hear a little bit more from you around the year, the year that has been 2020 and, and how you've steered British land throughout that, that period and, and whether this year has been more powerful in terms of lessons for you than, than any other year. I'm not sure that it's been more powerful in terms of lessons. What I do think is it's maybe the benefit of learning lessons historically has kind of come in handy. I put it like that, you know, and I, we, we were just reflecting on it. You know, the work that we'd done planning around Brexit right back on the, on the um, you know, on the table again, obviously. But but we'd done a lot of work, contingency planning, you know, ironically, that planning came in very useful when we found ourselves in COVID. You know, there's this thing that the army has around, you know, you'll, the plan will never survive contact with the enemy is, is, is how I think Napoleon's supposed to have described it. But, you know, the planning is nevertheless important. And that's what we found, that the planning, although not, it wasn't that the ex what happened was expected, but we had a set of contingencies, what if planning? And that methodology, I think, worked out very well for us. And, and you are, of course, um, leaving the listed world, world to go into a mildly political world, which we'll, we'll talk, uh, talk about a bit, bit later. But the, the listed world is a, is a very um, transparent place to be, isn't it? And I wonder how that has felt as a, as a CEO for the last um, 11 plus years and whether um, you've found any challenges with that, any frustrations at, at leading a, a listed business? You know, I think on the one hand, there'll always be frustrations in every job, right? But but I've always felt very strongly that it's a privilege to have had this job and, and therefore sort of dealt with it as a natural consequence of being in a privileged position. And if you get, you know, nasty things written about you, hey, hey, that goes with the job, um, as long as you don't take it personally. And I, I do think that, you know, that your world, if, if you were, in my experience, has been pretty fair. Um, and... You know, I know that there are other industries, if you will, where people look much more closely at people's personal lives and all that stuff. I've never felt that degree of people trying to encroach on that. I've tried to keep my family separate from that. And I think apart from the occasional, you know, dad, what are they writing about you today conversation? It's been just fine. And I don't know about you, but I, I very often, uh, more often than I'd, I'd like to admit, I suppose, get, get the odd letter from someone who doesn't necessarily agree with uh, what, what I might write. Um, do, as, as chief executive, do you get those letters from, from shareholders? Have you got any, any memorable letters? Um, have I got any? I, I certainly, 
I think the the complaint letters are always, you know, we, we've got a big public facing business and, and the complaint letters are almost always painful to receive because the truth is that usually we've messed up in some way. It's not, you know, we don't get many kind of unfair complaints, I don't think. And it's more often than not, it's an honest mistake. It's because people were busy or whatever. But, you know, you, you, it's always painful to receive you know, to receive those letters and think, or emails as they normally are, you know, we could have done better. So that's, that's probably the, the, the thing that I remember the most. You know, if you, if you do the job, then obviously you have a, a regular opportunity to listen to your shareholders and sometimes they're very polite and sometimes less so. And that again is part of the job. And do you think that has changed at all over, over your tenure? We've obviously seen the business world evolve quite a lot over the last couple of years in terms of um, the priorities for for investors for for shareholders it, has that changed the the, lang the language that you're hearing from from shareholders yes I think it has um, I think the momentum between behind quote unquote ESG has clearly gone up you know people's priority list from frankly a decade ago to not being of any interest whatsoever, uh, if truth be known. Uh, and even when we talked about it, it was like, yeah, really? Now can I talk about performance? And I think that's changed. And I think my, my sense is talking, you know, to all sorts of people, it's striking how different that is. And maybe particularly striking about that's how that's happening in the US, which, you know, was arguably a relatively slow to get going on this. And now, guess what? It's, it's pretty intense. Uh, as a debate. So I think that is a change. And do you think that will continue and intensify? That's my best guess, because I think, you know, once these things get a certain momentum, then it becomes impossible to kind of let go at, at any level. But I also think, you know, it's that thing about follow the money. And so much, the difference, I think, is that so much money is now being kind of tagged in some way around either a positive ESG story or a kind of, but not in these sectors because they're not. So, so I just think that that debate is going to intensify um, and, and all the things that will go with that, you know, is it greenwashing, is it for real? Just arguably in the same way as, you know, that little part of it that we talked about right at the outset around, you know, you talking about diversity and really doing stuff. I think that those things will, those sorts of debates will go right across that agenda rather than just one part of it is my best guess. And how do you think um, real estate is is reacting or behaving in, in, in terms of those sort of new drivers that are around being, whether that's ESG, diversity, wellness? Yeah, I, you, I do think there's been quite a big change in the industry. You know, when, when I, dare I say, started, uh, you, you know, more than a decade ago, it felt like if you talked about diversity, then people were a bit, it wasn't just a BL thing, as you know, it was a broader thing. I think that's changed today. And, and, and you know, you're, you're part of that, Sam, is that much more woven into the fabric of many of the businesses in the industry, and m much of the thinking of a whole bunch of really senior people. I, I think what's gone with that has been a bigger focus on customers. And with that comes, you know, things like wellness are just, I think, more part of what certainly we as a company have been doing but just more generally and I think that's a good thing and I think it, it reflects an industry that's much more flexible than it was a decade or so ago. And do you see that there's still more work to be done and if there is a, 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 a biggest part of work to be done where would you like real estate um, despite kind of leaving it behind where would you like it to, to put that effort? Well, I'm, hopefully I'm not exactly leaving it behind. We'll see. But, um, you know, I, I think that, um, first of all, I think, you know, if you, it, things cannot stay the same. They either go forward or they go backwards. So, so you know, you, you, I think we've got to keep focusing on all these matters and not just gender, but diversity more, more generally. And, and clearly Black Lives Matter has, has, has raised that topic right up the agenda and, and, and created, a, I think, a different spirit, if you will, than, than existed 
even a relatively short period of time ago. So I think that's a great example. But more generally, I think that there is just an enormous amount of work in this industry that needs doing in terms of a quality of opportunity, in terms of you know being less still, even though it's moved a lot, less of a boys club, all those sorts of things. You know, Let's not forget there's still aspects of that and, and people are going to have to keep working on it because if you, you look around, you'll find that it slipped backwards a bit. Yeah, yeah. But there has been, I, I suppose, a, a bit of a changing of the guard um, over the last year or so, um, uh, particularly across um, across the REITs. You know, we're seeing obviously Simon taking over from, from you, Mark, at, at Landsec and Amrita Rose coming in at, at Hammerson. Uh, do you think, is that part of this, this um, this new sort of focus on on those key drivers or, or why do you think there's there's been that changing of the guard i'm not sure first of all if, if you look at these things then you know guess what sometimes you get no change at all sometimes you go so i don't think you know robert had done a good spell all of those chief executives you touch on for different reasons you know it was it, it was time for a change and i think that's a very healthy thing i, I, I don't think there's that much to to read into it i don't think you know, any, I don't think it was a sort of meeting of chairs, you know, a year ago saying, uh, maybe we should get rid of this lot. Uh, I don't think it, maybe there was, I don't know. But I, I yeah, don't it's think not so. what I heard. No, I me mean, neither. So, you know, um, look, I, I, I just think it's sort of inter interesting. And there is, you know, one of the reasons I'm so excited about Simon taking over is precisely because of that, you know, that fresh set of eyes, a different, um, you know, a different way of looking at world of the world together with a lot of exp experience and expertise around British land. I think that's a great combination for us as a business. Um, but, but I think, and, and, you know, for me, I felt that 12 years was a good time, but, but time enough as well. And, and, and so I think that sense of regeneration of moving on is a very healthy thing. Absolutely. And, and I guess that we've talked a lot through the pages of EG actually about the, you know, it's great to have um, new thoughts and new, new views coming in, but also, you know, as we prepare for what's going to be a um, pretty bumpy ride for the next couple of years, uh, um, it's important to have uh, those who've um, seen it and been there before um, available for for some advice or some some learning as well. So, are you are you going to make sure you're you're still available if uh, if someone needs to call on you and say, hey? Well, you know, I, I would hope so. I'm certainly not changing my telephone number, so that's that, <laughs> you know, got to change my email. But uh, and I will send you the new one. But 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 you know, I I just think that it's a, it's that balance, isn't it? If if people want advice, terrific, happy to give it. But equally, you know, I've I've tried to be very clear with people at British Land in particular. You know, Simon's the boss. Um, you know, and I don't want to be seen as some spectre in the background. That's not <laughs> how I think one should operate. So. You know, uh, but but for the industry more generally, absolutely. You know, I'm, I'm sure there'll be interesting conversations to be had over the next uh, spell. Absolutely. So at the beginning of our conversation, you you talked about some of the some of the um, greatest things that you're going to take away from from BL and those being you know sort of walking around the city and looking at buildings and saying I, I did that. And you mentioned the the cheese grater. I wonder if you could talk us through and um, perhaps some more of your sort of highlights of, of your tenure and the things that you will look at and be and be proud of sure and it's it's interesting you you sort of come to the end of a spell in a job and you think gosh you, you make your little list but making my little list or big list or whatever I, I mean i think the the work we did on camp and it is a we right uh, and i think it's it's very dangerous to start using the i word but you know i think the work that we at british land did around campuses broadgate you know, buying Paddington, those things, I think we, we did make that different. We sort of ended up, I think, almost defining how mixed use should look in London. And that sounds a cocky thing to say, and I don't really mean it that way. But I think, and there were many, not just BL, but there were many people who advised us. But that's something I'm very proud of, because I think it ends up being better for our customers, if you will. Um, you know, other things, I think Clarges was a great thing to do. You know, we, we, we it's one of those it's easy to forget just a, what a long-term business really the state is, but that's a project that, you know, when, when, when we, uh, we hadn't bought it when I arrived, we sold all the apartments. Then we sold just recently, actually, the, 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 the office piece. That's, there's something very nice about beginning to end and having done it in your tenure. So that, those are bits and pieces which 
which are, you know, I like to look back on. And well, let's let's stick with um, buying and selling selling things and um, uh, getting deals across the line um, this year. Well done on that, by the by the way. I wonder what are your thoughts on I guess the future of real estate and and London. You know, London is um, well from tomorrow. It's really going to struggle, isn't it? Having going into into tier tier three. Is yeah. it gonna is it gonna survive? How are we gonna get through this? I don't think there's any doubt that London will survive and thrive. I mean, this is this is a city that you know has its origins, you know, a thousand years ago or longer. How, how do you think about it? And so there are lots of great reasons why people want to come to London, and we and I'm not going to rehearse those because because most people on this call will know them as well as I do. I don't think those things disappear overnight. I think the problem is going to be around the damage to the infrastructure, you know, the businesses that don't return, uh, the confidence. Those things are going to take a while, I think, um, one way or another. You know, we've done, tried to do our bit to support businesses, particularly food and beverage. You know, it's, it's, it's a tough old business at the best of times and of late just been absolutely brutal. So we've, we've done what we can. Uh, but I think, you know, that, that will take a while. But on the other hand, the, the physical infrastructure remains. So, you know, out of, out of those ashes, which I do fear, I'm sure great things will come and great ideas will come. You know, some of the confidence of, of, of some of our, you know, you use the word, I don't much like it either, of tenants, but our customers, you know, is, is pretty inspiring as to how things will happen. It will get going, but it's going to be tough. And, and it's not just going to be tough for, for tenants, for customers either. It's, it's going to be tough for, for real estate and, and I know we've talked about this before, but real estate hasn't really had a great deal of support through this time. It's had to be the supporter, which I know many firms have worked really hard at, at, at doing that. But there will come a time when government needs to um, help out real estate as well and understand that it's it's uh, not all, all fat cats and sovereign wealth funds. No, I, I agree. Um, I think it's been an unfortunate thing. Um, I think you have to delve quite deeply into the politics to see what's happened. And, you know, I think that, that quite a lot of small businesses felt they were getting a bad deal from quite a lot of the, their landlords. And I think government in the end reacted to that. But, you know, it's, it's not quote unquote fair, but we look, we like everybody else have had that conversation with government. They've got a lot on their mind um, and they're trying to do the best. So, but, but can this, is it, things will have to change. Do you think there's a, there's an opportunity for, for real estate out of, out of this year and um, out of having those conversations with government that it will learn to understand more? Maybe. I think if you talk to a lot of industries, they will tell you the same thing, which is it's been difficult to get government to hear and I think it's easy to kind of make that comment in a glib way but also they've had their hands very full you know it's, it's put huge strain on, on governments around the world you know if you read the newspapers from other countries the level of criticism of government generally and the stress on government generally is very very high and I think it's important to remember that however cross we get about individual decisions is just the pressure on the individuals, the civil servants, the politicians, is pretty unattractive. Fantastic. And I'm just gonna, I've just had a question come in from one of our audience, so thank you for that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pose this one to you before I hog all of them. Um, it's a question that asks, will PLCs like British Land, um, who both develop and invest, survive? Uh, what, what's the value of having the two functions under one roof? Yes, I think they will. I think that the the idea of just owning real, real estate and sort of sitting there clip, clipping the coupon, if you will, itself is is quite a complicated concept because, you know, in the end, these buildings tend to depreciate. They depreciate at a different rate and you have to kind of fix them. Um, otherwise, they become, you know, redundant. And so... The idea, you know, are you investing in the, in, in the ground? Are you investing in the building? Those are complicated things. So I think the combination is a natural one. Can you make it slightly more one way or the other? Of course, and people try to do that. But it's interesting to see 
you know, organizations like the private equity organizations that historically probably weren't developers for one reason or another, mainly because of the permanence of capital, guess what? They now have long-term funds and they're starting to get in the, into the same business. So, so I think it, you know, and they're in both. So I think there's, there's plenty of space for high quality businesses like ours. And do, do you expect that we'll see see more? I think when I look at the the listed um, listed firms the, these days, you know, we are um, globally anyway. UK listed real estate firms are pretty pretty small. There's probably probably ripe for consolidation or or takeover. What's your view on the on the real estate REIT? It's a great question, and I get. But having said that, Sam, you know, the same questions were posed to me 12 years ago, you know, <laughs> hey, isn't it time you merge with Landsat uh, was, if not the first presentation I received from a banker, certainly in the top first five. Um, so I think these questions will always exist. You know, you've certainly seen of late, you know, private equity making investments in a number of firms, in, including British land. I think generally speaking, that's a good thing, by the way. Um, and of course, there's a risk of takeover. Um, these guys have you know, really big dollops of capital kicking around. But but our job, my successor's job, <laughs> is is to do the business really well. And then, you know, by and large, you'll find that the ownership sort of sorts itself out. I guess, does it does it really matter if, uh, if you've got the culture of a business right, whether it's uh, publicly owned or privately owned? I think that, you, you know, there are certain things, certain ways that different sorts of companies get judged, aren't there? And we, we, we talked about things like ESG and, you know, that will be different in, in under, to some extent under different ownership structures. But I think the whole world's going in that direction anyway. So at one level, I don't think it really matters. And you're seeing so much money going into private, but also going into sovereign wealth and every other way. And, you know, we have a number of all those sorts of organizations uh, on our register, share register today. So at some level, I agree with you, it doesn't matter. Um, and I think, but I do think that public ownership is a, is a good thing. Um, for the transparency reasons or for other yeah, reasons? Yeah, and, and, and you know, look, it's, it's a different for, form of discipline, but you know, I, I can tell you when you go around the, well, not this year, obviously, but go around the world talking to shareholders, they take it, you know, they subject you to a very high level of scrutiny and generally speaking, and also come up with some good ideas. I mean, it's a very, I think it's a much more, what's the right way of putting it? It's a much more kind of, uh, you know, mutually, if you think about it well, I think it's a mutually beneficial, challenging relationship at its best. And that's a good thing. But look, private equity does that in another way. So, you know, either, either, either model works, I think. So, so you mentioned that one of the first questions you got, got asked or in the top five was, uh, uh, are you going to merge with Landsec? How are you going to um, tell Simon to answer that question? Because it'll never so, get asked again. I might do it. Yeah, of course, I'm sure you will. I'm surprised you haven't <laughs> done it already, Sam. Um, yeah, first of all, I think the idea of telling Simon anything would be a bad plan, don't you? Uh, <laughs> you know, he's his own man, and, and rightly so. And, you know, I've, I've stepped down, and so uh, I've certainly no intention of telling, telling him to do anything. And I, I, <laughs> if he asks, I'll, I'll give him my opinion. But as I say, you know, we stay separate for 12 years, so there's a reason for that. Um, and quite some of those reasons still still stay the same, I suspect. <laughs> Fantastic. Now I know we've only got about ten minutes left, so uh, I'm gonna. Oh, I'd love to talk to you about about what's next. I know um, obviously you've got a reasonably sized job uh, lined up advising on the new infrastructure bank. So I'd love to know um, a little more about that if you're able to to share that with us. Sure. I mean, I'm you know I'm a um, I'm an advisor to the Treasury. The bank's going to be. Uh, formed in the Treasury, but will eventually be somewhat separate from Treasury. There's a reason for that. And, and, and one way to think about it, it's not the only way, but, but, you know, Treasury, the government is very conscious of the fact that, you know, as we step away from the EU, the EIB no longer lends into the UK. It's, it's actually, you know, lent a lot on, and granted a lot of money over the years into the UK. And so having that kind of, you know, public sector uh, facilitator, uh, into infrastructure projects in the UK feels like quite an important project and hopefully I can add some value there um, over the, over a period of time. And and lessons that you've learned from from running British land will be applied into into the thinking there? Well you know I think just 
coming from a private sector, if you will, you know, the commercial sector. And as you know, I, I did some jobs in banking before, before I took the job at British Land. So, but I think the main thing is that perspective being different uh, from those of the, the other people setting it up. And I think that's a very healthy thing, you know, although I absolutely type, take the point about being, you know, white and middle class and so forth, you know, um, I'm not gonna let you forget that, but how could I? But, you know, it's a diversity of perspective. And I think hopefully that that will add some value. That's why I said I would do it to give that pers different perspective. Fantastic. And is there anyone you're gonna miss from real estate? Oh, a lot of people. I mean, I think, you know, it's, it, I think it's extraordinary uh, in the sense of, you know, for, for a business in the end is about, if you will, hard assets. The people are so important and it's such a great, great group. I, I miss, I think inevitably the people from and of British land more than any other single group. Definitionally, they've been a huge part of my life for the last 12 years. Um, but I also miss all the people who've advised us, you know, informally, formally, all, it's just been a great, great group of people and a great experience. And anyone you won't miss? Actually, you know what? No, not really. I mean, I, I think it's, well, you, you know, it's, it, part of that experience is, is it's not everybody being nice to you. You know, some of the, Diff, some of our difficult customers, you know, you've written about one or two of them. Um, but, you know, that's been an experience too. And it, it also, if you're dealing with somebody who's tough and unreasonable, you know what? The next day it's more fun when you meet somebody who's not like that. Excellent. And now, um, just to finish this off, I've got a few quick fire questions. There's one actually from, from the audience so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with, which is uh, on your last day when you're clearing your desk and putting your personal belongings in, in your brown cardboard box. Uh, what, what little message are you gonna leave on that desk for Simon? Well, I've already done it because he took over, you know, nearly a month ago. Um, I didn't leave a message, um, you know. I, I, I thought the best message was to make sure the room was empty, you know. <laughs> and sanitized, of course, in these Of times. course, I mean, you know, of course. <laughs> um, so the, the, uh, the title of this, um, interview was outgoing chief executive so I just wondered what the most outgoing thing you've ever done is outgoing gosh yeah. I'm not sure I know what I'm what you mean definitely not what I would talk about I, you know I think the first time you have to stand up and do a set of results in my case actually it was before that when we did the rights issue that was you know I, I was very new to the business I was trying to learn about real estate I was trying to uh, learn about the company standing up and asking people to give you well not give you but you know, subscribe a load of equity. That was a moment of, you know, feeling a little bit nervous, shall we say. So that was probably <laughs> the most. Now I'm really out on the tightrope a little bit. Excellent. And um, I asked this question on, on Twitter when I was trying to get people to give us some um, quick fire um, questions for you. They're all very shy. And um, so you might have had, you might be ready for this one. But um, if you were a superhero, you could have any superhero power, what power would it be and why? Oh, it's the thing that I always tell people, you know, I'm not psychic. If you want to manage people really well, it's awfully ha handy if you're psychic. So that would be mine. It's a good one to have. It's a good one to have. Um, and I know that in uh, at British Land, you have um, dog days um, at British Land. I've just got a new puppy. Um, and I'm wondering, at having uh, looking after this pup, not can I have a job at BL? Um, uh, but what's the worst um, doggy accident you've ever had? in the British land office and has, has it ever happened in your office? I don't think we've had any bad um, accidents and if so I think they've been cleared up ahead of me getting there but but I think one of our colleagues brought in a very it's a big dog and it was very smelly and there was just a lot of complete you know the whole policy nearly got binned on the day uh, our head of HR was sort of besieged by people complaining about it so that was the near miss that we had it never came back <laughs> <The dog better>. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic and then the uh, final sort of quick fire question is um what's your your greatest faux pas that you've ever made i know we all do them <laughs> oh it's it's got to be with you know investors it's you know those horrible moments where you forget who you're talking to or but nothing too bad i don't think but that's usually the one you know you you, you find that you've um, you know, you've been talking about the wrong thing to the, actually, but the worst was just not, now I think about it. 
the, the most embarrassing moment was on a results call. And, uh, you know, you have the questions at the end. And this guy, um, he's a very nice guy, um, but he has quite a strong accent. I won't tell you which one because it would make it too obvious. But he asked me a question and I just didn't understand a word of it. So I asked him, could he repeat the question? He repeated the question and I had no more clue. And I'm like, where am I going with this? And so I just, I was like, I don't know what to do now. I just made up an answer. I had no idea. It was like, yeah, it's 32. Next question. That was, that was a horrible moment. Did he respond or you moved on so quickly? I moved on so quickly. I was, it was like, and I, I, I kept on thinking I should have probably just said, I think Lucinda was at the time the FD, I should have said, Lucinda, what do you think? But I couldn't be that mean. <laughs> Always pass the buck. That should be a, a lesson from leadership. I don't think that one works. <laughs> Um, Chris, thank you so much for this. Before we go, I guess it just um, just leaves us to to um, ask you the I guess three three pointers from from you that every real estate leader, every business leader should should keep close to to them if they want to survive as long as as long as you did in, in tenure and um, and really deliver a a modern business going forward. Three pointers. Wow. Well, look. Always think about the people. You know, have you got the right people? And and the answer is not always the same forever. You know, people are people change, and your requirements change. So it's all about the people. I think um, you know where, where where we've got things wrong. We've usually got it wrong because we've believed ourselves. You know, what they call owners bias. So I'd say always be cautious of owners bias. And then at the end of the day, you know, if you're going to run a business or if you're going to be a lead, in a leadership position, remember that it is about leadership. You can't you can't back away from that. Those would be my three. Three excellent pointers. Uh, Chris, thanks so much for, for joining us today. Thanks to everyone for, for listening in. Thanks for the excellent questions that were shared, shared with us. And I'll now hand back to, to Lee. Thanks so much, Sam. Thank you, Chris. Well, it was a brilliant interview. Thank you both so much. And I, I know we'll see, Chris, we'll see Chris again on one of these events. We'll invite him back for sure. And you, Sam. So that was a brilliant insight, I think, into kind of leading a PLC prop co. Obviously, the challenges. And um, Chris, you are a great ambassador for the industry. And we do look forward to talking more. So thank you very much for your time today. And thank you, Sam. And I'm sure we'll do more with you next year as well. So thank you both. Um, and to our Movers and Shakers members, um, we thank you very much for your support this year. And indeed also to all of our partners, um, to be known who are our PR and comms partner, to Steve Edge Design, uh, our designers and our data partner, CoStar. So thank you to you all. And as I said, we'll be launching our new virtual events platform uh, early January and our networking app. So there's a lot to look forward to. We wish you a Merry Christmas, a happy and healthy new year from our family to yours. Thank you.